Hey all, uh, thanks for joining. Yeah, no problem, what's up? Fuck, uh, I have not been having a good time lately. Yep, we're aware, mm -hmm. but hey, you know, we're here, we care about you, so we'll figure it out. What's on your mind? So like, this is hard to explain, so I'm gonna set up a hypothetical to try and lay out the issue. So let's assume that we have a situation where you have an online political figure who seems to have at least pretty decent intentions most of the time. They make content that's progressive or left-leaning, and not only that, but they're also a pretty prominent queer content creator, which helps make the space generally more inclusive. But, oh uh, no, let's also say that maybe, while they seem altogether nice enough, that they may end up discussing a subject or subjects that they don't actually know that much about, and as a consequence, end up spreading misinformation on the subject. But it's delivered in such a way that most of their followers won't end up noticing, so they don't get that much pushback at all. Do we know if they're aware of the fact that they're spreading misinformation? I mean, probably not. It's hard to say, since it's not like we're able to read their mind. All we have to go off of are their actions. Yes, but at this point, I'm just trying to make sure that they're not grifting. Like, do we know how much they make from social media content? We can assume that they make a decent amount. Wait, why does that matter? Because we can't know what they believe. It's impossible. So the best we can do is look at the circumstantial evidence and make inductive guesses about what their motivations are. And if they end up spreading misinformation and making a lot of money while doing it, that's pretty decent evidence to suggest that they're grifting. I'm not sure if I agree with that. So sure, this person would be making a lot of money, and part of that would be profiting from spreading misinformation. But I think there are two factors which may distinguish them from a typical grifter. First, I would imagine that they wouldn't be spreading nearly as much misinformation as most prominent conservative content creators. And second, like, I don't know, I might actually make the claim that even if they do, if nobody notices and they end up doing a lot more good for progressive causes, maybe it's okay. I'm sorry, what? Okay, yeah, this is why this has been messing with my head. I mean, like, there are a ton of other places where we could talk about this and a ton of other reasons and we'll get into them, but yeah, this is probably the, a decent place to start. Like, how do we deal with this kind of a situation? I'm going to be honest, I have no idea why you're having a hard time with this. Riley, this is the most open and shut hypothetical ever. Regardless of whether they are a nice person, if they spread misinformation, we need to call it out and condemn it. The thing that we principally have to win people over politically is the fact that the people who follow us know they can trust us to be right. If we let this slide, not only does it potentially jeopardize that trust, but it also means we end up giving more ammunition to our political opponents to let them continue to hold on to political relevancy. I don't want to end up in a debate with someone on the alt-right where I have to play defense the entire time disavowing every bad argument made by people who happen to be politically aligned with me. I just want to focus on my affirmative arguments, which I know to the best of my ability to be right, and just win with that. Um, green? All right. So, yellow? I love you, and for the most part, I agree with everything that you said. Misinformation is bad. The reason we have a superior claim to political relevancy is because the facts are on our side. I agree with all of that. I just want us to be careful here because the way that you framed it, it sounds like you just made it out that whenever people on the left engage in spreading misinformation, that it makes them functionally equivalent to people on the right. Uh, yeah. I don't really see a distinction at that point. In fact, I probably see that as a higher priority of concern. Wait, really? You see it as a higher priority of concern that someone on the left may make a mistake about the nuances of economic theory when people on the right are going around spreading vaccine conspiracies? You think these things are not only equivalent, but that the former is of higher concern than the latter? No, Green, I don't. I can acknowledge that in terms of the potential overall impacts on society, that a lot of the misinformation spread by the right vastly outweighs that spread by the left in terms of the harm it'll end up causing to people. I'm not disputing that. What I am saying is that right now, one of the most pressing issues of our time is the fact that people are living in two entirely different worlds because of the effects of misinformation. 
and when it is more important now more than ever to be able to be the side that people can actually place trust in to accurately give them the facts, then it is paramount to me to reduce the possibility of jeopardizing that trust as much as possible. And that requires being critical of people who otherwise may mean well, then so be it. So Green, right now I gotta be honest, I'm largely siding with Yellow at this point. Like, even if the person in this hypothetical means well, if they're going to have such a large public platform, then I would at least reasonably expect them to put in the time and effort to make sure that they're not spreading misinformation and harming the larger cause. Riley, how has that been going over for you this year? Um, what do you mean? Well, you've been at 23,000 subscribers since basically the beginning of the year. Last year, uploading what? Daily? What happened? I realized I wasn't making the kind of content that I felt comfortable with. Why didn't you feel comfortable with it? Because it, when you're a streamer, you basically have to upload every day. That's essentially how the YouTube algorithm knows whether to reward you with engagement. So at the beginning, it was fun because I only talked about a handful of subjects that I felt reasonably informed on. But as time went on, I encountered more complex subjects and issues. And complex subjects and issues take time to research. Time that I didn't have between law school, internships, getting ready for surgery, starting up my master's program. I had a lot going on. And I didn't feel comfortable making more content without being able to be absolutely sure that I wasn't spreading any misinformation. So how much has that actually helped you? What are you trying to say, Green? I just want to point out that while this is all well and good, and I agree that it's important to put in as much work as can be reasonably expected of someone to make sure that they're not spreading misinformation, we also have to remember that these are conversations that almost no one else is having right now. Whenever news breaks, Fox News and Steven Crowder aren't hiring fact checkers and researchers to give them reports and ensure that they're only giving the most objectively accurate and unbiased accounts possible. They engage in spreading misinformation all the time, and I don't want to just sit by and give them a monopoly on political narratives because I might risk being technically wrong in my initial statements. Okay, to be clear, there are ways to ethically cover breaking news. Most people, including people on the left, usually don't even bother reading past the headlines for news articles. Listen, when you're trying to make sure that the far right doesn't steal away a political narrative, people don't want to listen to, now, we only have a handful of the facts currently, so it's better for us to wait for the proper authorities to investigate then. No! Fuck that. If there's injustice, then I want to rile people up, because if I don't, then someone else will. I'm not going to sacrifice my entire political cause because of my principles. Principled failure means nothing to me. Principled victory means everything. So, that's it. You're willing to just sacrifice the truth if it means winning. Don't frame it like that, Yellow. You know that I care about the truth. The problem I have is that when there are people I'm competing against who don't care about the truth, and they're able to win more as a consequence, then I can't afford to do the you go low, we go high bit. We know that never actually works out in principle when dealing with the far right. We see how that works out when Democrats try it in Congress, and every single time it ends up screwing them over. Because if one party cares about the truth, and the other party cares about winning, then the latter is going to take advantage of any charitability afforded by people who actually try to reach a compromise and otherwise never extend anything back to them in return. If they're going to play dirty, and the only way I can compete with them is by playing dirty as well, then so be it. And after we win, then we can take all the time in the world to make sure that we can be as factually accurate as possible. So, Green, I want to try and get what you're saying right so that there's no misunderstanding between us, okay? Sure. So you agree that the truth is important. Yes. But you're fine with sacrificing it when you're competing with political figures or movements that don't care about the truth? Yes, but here only insofar as I'm not going to focus on giving every single person I talk to a 20-page PowerPoint or resource guide for every single thing that I say. So like, maybe I end up getting something wrong, but it's not because I don't care about what's true. But if the people I'm competing against all just act in blatant bad faith, where they will never extend any charitability to arguments against their positions even when they reasonably should, then it's not in my interest to engage with them in good faith and be the person who doubles over backwards always double and triple checking what I say. If all they care about is winning, then that's all that I'm going to care about. Uh, so like, I get what you're saying. It's just, I don't know, something about this just doesn't sit right with me. Uh, 
Yeah, I'll say. Let me ask you this, Green. Let's say that what you're saying is true, that because a lot of larger figures on the right, especially online, are willing to sacrifice the truth in order to push a political narrative, that they have an inherent advantage at taking control of political narratives early on, since they would not be competing against good faith actors who would be spending that time researching the topic and waiting for more information. Instead of engaging with the same kinds of unethical behavior that they do, why not focus instead on being the person who engages with their arguments and holds them accountable after the fact? Like I mentioned earlier, most people do generally care about the truth insofar as deciding what political beliefs and figures to ascribe to. It may be the case that Tucker Carlson ends up moving a lot of people over to the right, but you could be the person to move those people back over after showing them, hey, I know you heard this thing from Fox News, but I actually put in the time to fact check it and here's how they lied to you. I would think that that would be an ethical way to engage with the kinds of people like you described without risking spreading misinformation. I have two problems with that. First, I don't think that most people actually care about the truth when deciding what political beliefs or figures to ascribe to. Like, Trump constantly lied to his followers, and yet he was still able to get literally the second most votes in history in the 2020 election. And I would bet that but for the coronavirus that he would have won. I think that what ends up actually persuading people most of the time is rhetoric. And I don't have to do any research or prep ahead of time in order for my rhetoric to always be strong. So if my goal is moving as many people over to my side as possible, then it's in my interest to put out as many videos as possible where I'm being as rhetorically effective as possible. So that's the first thing. Second, even if I wanted to do the kind of content like what you're describing, it would basically force me to just become a video essayist. And while there are some video essayists who do wonderful work, you only end up hearing from them like once or twice a year. And what we need is to have leaders who can guide people through evolving political discourses in real time, not dark mothers who only appear on Twitter once in a blue moon to tweet out how they may or may not be a cat girl. But it's fine to have those too. Yes, we can have both. Agreed. But okay, then if you think it's necessary to compete with these figures by creating as much content as possible, then I guess I don't get why you can't just make a substantial part of what you do researching the things they say and engaging with these figures in good faith, even if they may not return the favor. If someone isn't going to agree with you, no matter what you say, then you can make these people look potentially ludicrous when they disagree with obviously correct statements. And beyond that, most of the time you can expose these people just by going through their sources with them or asking them to explain their position since they'll fumble doing just that alone and end up hanging themselves. But what about the people who that doesn't work for? What about the people who are smart enough to operate with the pretense of factual accuracy, who start citing studies to support their positions but end up wildly mischaracterizing them? And what about the people who are rhetorically effective enough to know how to come across as reasonable by stating smaller individual things which sound true on their own but together imply a larger falsehood? The thing is, I don't think it's possible to engage in good faith with these kind of figures. When you're dealing with someone who is fundamentally focused on winning an interaction, rather than pursuing what's true, then that means you'll end up conceding on every reasonable argument they make, while they will never concede on any argument you make, no matter what you say at all, period. They will do everything they can to avoid agreeing with you, whether it's pivoting to a completely different subject, or ending the conversation conveniently early, or shifting the goalposts far beyond where they set them initially as themselves. And even you, Yellow, for all of your experience dealing with these kind of figures online, even you will let them slip by sometimes. But not me. If they really want to fuck around, I say, let them find out. So, Green, how do you know if someone is engaging in good faith? For a lot of this, honestly, I'm kind of with you. But it seems like basically once you've made the determination that someone is acting in bad faith, all bets are off. As long as you say that you do fundamentally care about the truth and are only making an exception under these particular circumstances, I can see how that is at least a reasonable position. But if that's the case, how do you make the determination of whether someone is acting in bad faith to begin with? Well, I mean, I think that the main aspect is when someone lies about what they believe. Like, if I say that someone is virtue signaling, then I think they are lying when they say that they care about a particular subject. In that case, I would probably say that they're acting in bad faith. Hmm... I'm not sure if I agree with that. You also just said that you won't act in good faith when you engage with these figures, right? Uh, yeah, and? And I assume that means that you're instead engaging with them in bad faith, right? Um, 
I mean, in a more neutral sense here, yeah, I guess. They're looking to win, so I am too. Okay, sure, that's fair. So then I would assume that while you are engaging with these figures in bad faith, that you aren't lying about what you believe, right? Like, aiming to win a conversation for you would not be the same as arguing for something that you do not believe to be true. Huh. Um, yeah, that's fair. Okay, you see my issue then. Uh, Yellow, what do you think? I would probably define bad faith as meaning that someone isn't engaging with an argument, even if it should make sense to them, or if they're actively trying to deliberately circumvent an argument that they would believe defeats theirs. Okay, see, that makes sense. That seems to track with the idea of bad faith actors trying to win that we've been discussing so far. Sure, I can agree with that. Okay, but now we still have a major problem. Can you tell what it is, Green? Um, no. What's up? In order to know whether someone is acting in bad faith, we now need to be able to know what their mindset is. This means that we need to not just have an understanding of whether someone's argument is factually correct, but we also need to be able to know why someone makes that argument in the first place. It could be the case that you're able to adequately respond to someone's argument on the merits of the issue, but if you don't address the underlying rationale for why they believe it, then it could be the case that they still refuse to change their mind despite having heard a logical argument to do so. And in that case, I'm not sure if it, that scans with what we agree that it means to be bad faith. Well, then we could specify not just that someone isn't engaging with an argument that should make sense to them, but they're not engaging with an argument that should reasonably make sense to them. If someone is acting unreasonable, then I don't think that excuses them from bad faith. I didn't say that excuses them, but I'm really hesitant to attach an objective standard to when we're only trying to suss out someone's subjective mindset. And by that standard, we would end up probably calling a substantially large portion of the U.S. population unreasonable for refusing to get COVID vaccinations, which you could argue, but then it starts collapsing in on itself as a useful standard at that point. We probably don't want to just write off every Trump supporter as unreasonably bad faith and therefore justify not having to make any effort to understand their mindsets. We are a democracy. We win by moving people over. But there's a problem with this, Riley. None of us are mind readers. There is no way to know with absolute certainty what someone's subjective mindset is. That's why objective standards are useful. They allow us to make appeals to how people act on average and make conclusions about how someone should act in a particular circumstance, irrespective of what their actual mindset is. But that's exactly my problem. There is no way to know with absolute certainty what someone's mindset is. I think we can be able to make inductive guesses based on the totality of available evidence, but that's the best we can do. Like, why do you think it takes some video essayists so much time to make their videos? For everyone who copies them, what actually makes them special isn't their over-the-top theatrics. It's the fact that they not only make good arguments, but spend so much time trying to understand the people they're arguing with that they also know how to make them in such a way that they're actually responsive to the motivations people have for making them in the first place. And as they're currently finding out, you could potentially spend an infinite amount of time trying to understand someone's mindset and always still be able to do a little bit better. And by the time they're finished, they understand the perspectives of the people they argue with so well that they're able to represent their arguments as well as if they argued them themselves. So what, Riley? Is it impossible to call someone bad faith? Not impossible, just a lot harder than I think most people take for granted. For example, often what people look for in bad faith actors is an unwillingness to understand their opponent's arguments. But that same kind of behavior could just be representative of someone's genuine failure to understand your points. So in order to determine if someone is acting in bad faith, I think you have to basically become an expert on not only the arguments someone makes, but the motivations of the particular person making those arguments. And that's going to be based on circumstantial evidence, and sometimes that will be easier than others. But the point is that I think it's not something that can just be thrown around lightly. So are you saying that you want to become an expert in online political figures? Uh, no, nah, fuck that. I've spent so much time this year dealing with internet drama that I haven't been able to do basically any of the research that I wanted to. 
I started out this year debating gender, and I keep getting dragged away from diving deeper into the literature. Of course, you know about that. Mm-hmm. Hey, Green. I think I have one more issue with this conversation of good faith. Uh, alright. Shoot. Let's say you get into several arguments with people on the far right. You determine them to be acting in bad faith, so instead of trying to reach a mutual understanding of what is true, you aim to win the interactions. Tracking so far? Sure. Okay. And let's say that in the course of these debates, you make an argument that your opponents were not able to defeat at the time that you made it. But, although you and your audience believed it to be true, you later get a message from someone in your community saying, Hey, I think that you're actually wrong about this issue. How would you deal with that situation? Um, well, I would probably try to resolve things off stream with them without making too much of a fuss. Why is that? Well, I would have just made that argument to several bad faith actors on the alt-right. I am disincentivized from giving those people any opportunity to get a win over me. And I know that they would hold it over me if I just came out and said that the argument I just used to own them was wrong. Even though I don't think they actually care about the truth, I know that they would use it as a way to discredit me into perpetuity. Sure, that makes sense. But if it then did turn out that you talked to this person off stream and that you were in fact wrong, since admitting you were wrong would mean giving the people you've debated on that subject that leverage over you, that would mean you're essentially marrying yourself to an argument that you know to be wrong as if it were true. I mean, like, maybe? That could happen, but I also think I could navigate that kind of situation to minimize the chance of that as much as possible. Like, if that did happen, instead of making a big deal about the fact that I was wrong, I could also just stop making that argument, let the statement stand for a while until the spotlight is moved on, and then retract it more quietly. That way, I'm no longer spreading misinformation and the people I debated can't smear me. Boom. <laughs> Problem solved. But then there wouldn't be any reason to think that your audience wouldn't continue to think that argument was in fact correct. If you don't make that retraction sufficiently public, then the people who follow you will still believe and disseminate that bad argument as if it were true. Okay, um, I see your point. I mean, I could probably get at least the core of my audience to understand what I'm saying. And usually my most active followers are the ones who go out and argue on my behalf, so if they understand what's up, I still think that would eliminate most of the issue. And what about the other hundreds of thousands of people who watch you daily? Sure. In that case, those people may continue to believe the bad argument as if it were true. But I've already acknowledged that I'm dealing with an imperfect situation. It's not like I want to do this. I'm competing against people who've already poisoned the space because they don't care about the truth at all. Sure, the way I engage with them may not end up being perfect. But I think that comparatively speaking, it ends up leading to a lot better outcomes than if I were to do otherwise. What about the people in your audience who notice that you're wrong and genuinely care about helping you do better? Like, how do you think those people are going to be treated by the hundreds of thousands of your fans who are still convinced that you're right? Riley. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll be all right. So what are you going to do? I think I'm going to try the video SAS route for a bit. Like, I do agree that there are a lot of bad faith actors online. So I don't want you to think that I'm trying to impugn you for thinking that. I think that's a pretty easy read of the space, actually. I just think that's a lot harder to know with certainty whether someone is acting in bad faith unless you basically become an expert in that person. But, although a lot of major figures online are bad faith actors, they spread a lot of ideas that people do believe in good faith. That's how they're able to get to be so popular. So, I think what I'll do is I'll pick a subject, become as familiar as possible with all the arguments that people make about it, and then sort of construct hypothetical good faith actors who I can be able to go through those arguments with. That way I can address those arguments in good faith while not engaging with or promoting the bad faith actors who make them.
That sounds all well and good. Do you have any idea if this is going to catch on? Nope. Well, you're still running into the responsiveness issue that we talked about earlier. Sounds like these kind of projects would take a lot of time. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I can live stream doing most of this work so people can at least keep up with me that way. But yeah, as far as daily discourse coverage, I think that what could be better is for me to take a more of a consulting position. Uh, okay, what's that going to look like? Well, if I'm spending all of my time researching different topics in depth, then I can imagine that over time, I would become a valuable resource for other good faith actors to rely on. If another public figure wanted to ask me about something that I've studied in relation to a relevant political discourse, I imagine I would be able to give them a greater insight than if they just went off on their own. I'm not sure if this would be a perfect solution to the problems we talked about earlier, but I think it would certainly be a step in the right direction. All right. Well, uh, you have fun with that. Uh, hey, Green? Hmm? Uh, thanks for talking. I, uh, I really need this. It helped a lot. No problem. Uh, take care. All right? All right. Uh, talk to you later. Bye. Hey everyone. Um Honestly, I am I, I can't express like just how happy I am right now. Um so first let me say thank you to everyone who supports me and has supported me throughout this year. Um it's been it's been a really long year. It's been a long year for everyone, but it's been a long year for me in terms of growth and finding myself and figuring out exactly what I want to do with my platform and how to contribute to the space. And I'm really, really appreciative that I have such an awesome, amazing community of people who has been there to support me and who has helped me to be able to grow and develop um, as a content creator, and I really appreciate that. Um, for everyone in my Discord who, I mean, I don't know, I hang out with you all the time, so uh, thank you all so much for helping me to make this video, for proofing it, um, for helping me research. Like, you all were amazing, you were great. Um, and of course, thank you to my patrons, um, especially Ben Masters, Nicole, Snakey FSU, Thane, Vaughn Vigil, Ian Martin, Pinko, The Purser, and Will Ispister. Uh, you all are absolutely amazing, and I wouldn't be able to do this without you, so thank you.